Good morning to all of you. From an evening uh, to listen about Indian cinema and secularism this morning, we listen about quantum mechanics, theory of chance, and so on from an eminent scientist, Dr. Narendra Kumar, former director of uh, Raman Research Institute. Today we also have a few other esteemed and distinguished uh, speakers to uh, speak to you, like Dr. Yogendra Narayan, who is the Secretary General of Rajya Sabha, Kiran Karnik, Chief of NASCOM, Punjab Singh, he is the Vice Chancellor of uh, Benares Hindu University. And this evening is again special for Niyas, and uh, we hope all of you. We have the second annual Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture. This lecture is in memory of uh, Dr. Raja Ramana, who is the founder director of this institute. And that lecture will be given by uh, Sri Shyam Saran. So let me now pass on uh, the chair mic to Professor Srikantan. Professor Srikantan, uh, you already have met him and known him a bit. He is the former director of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And he is a professor here, he's also the dean of the School of Humanities. And his interest has now spanned from cosmic rays to consciousness studies. Professor Shikantan. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a great honor for me to be present here today and uh, preside over this morning's lecture. Uh, Professor Kumar, you know, when he was first introduced to me by a common friend, Professor G. Suryan, he told me that uh, he described him as a scientist scientist, in the sense that he is one of those who has the facility to explain complicated things in an exceedingly simple way, which I'm sure you will all realize when uh, he completes his uh, presentation. He was, uh, till recently, the director of the Raman Research Institute, and uh, he has a very interesting career, which uh, let me read out to you. Uh, is a Homi Bhabha distinguished scientist at Raman Research Institute now, and honorary professor, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, staff associate of uh, Trieste. After BTEC in electronics, see, his career is very interesting, as you will see. His uh, BTEC was in electronics, MTEC in microwaves from IIT Kharagpur, PhD in physics from IIT Bombay, and postdoctoral teaching fellowship at the University of British Columbia. Uh, he joined Indian Science Bangalore in 1971, and then he became director of uh, the Raman Research Institute in 1994, which position he held for 11 years, which is quite a a, you know, long period of time. And uh, he has been a fellow of all the academies uh, in India, Indian Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences. He's also a fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences, fellow American Physical Society, and uh, he's, of course, winner of the Bhatnagar Prize, the, uh, th the Third World Academy Prize. I think now it's called, the, th it's, uh, the name has changed, I think. Uh, and uh, Mahendra Lal Sarkar Prize for uh, the Goyal Award, Meghna Saha Medal, uh, C.V. Raman Birth Centenary Award, Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Lecture, Distinguished Alumni Award of uh, IIT Bombay. And of course, uh, he is a Padma Shri, Distinguished uh, Material Scientist of the Year 2006. His uh, specialization or localization, conductance, fluctuations, metal insulator transition, strongly correlated systems, superconductivity, phase transitions, chaos, statistical physics, random lasers, quantum diffusion, and of course his other interests are cosmology, biology, and consciousness. Uh, may I request you to give your lecture? His lecture is Almighty Chance, the classical, the quantum, and the chaotic, the most interesting subject.
Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to be here this morning with you and to have this opportunity of sharing some thoughts uh, with you. Um, however, I do have uh, a bit of uneasiness. Uh, the reason is that uh, I think all that I'm going to say is something that you already know. That's the reason for the uneasiness. But I take uh, comfort and, um, and I take heart from a dictum uh, uh, proposed by a great uh, physicist of our time, the last century actually, Andrew Fermi. And he said, never underestimate the feeling of well-being and satisfaction that people derive from being told something that they already know. And I think uh, I will take refuge in that uh, dictum. And so even if you know what I'm going to say, there may be some justification in saying or repeating it, just in case. <clears throat> so uh, uh, with that, uh, uh, let me uh, say what I have to say to you. And um, the title of the talk is, of course, uh, right here. It says, uh, Almighty Chance, the Classical, the Quantum, and the Chaotic. And there is an abstract in this talk, and I understand it has been circulated to you. Uh, you may read it at uh, leisure. In fact, the abstract is fairly extended and says almost everything uh, that I'm going to say, though in a nutshell, of course. So uh, it is intentionally a very extended um, uh, abstract. <clears throat> now, um, so what's the, what's the question here that we are trying to address? The, the question is that, uh, by and large, we all know that this world, uh, the physical universe that we know of, to the extent we know of, is governed by certain laws. They may be unknown to us sometimes. All laws are not known. But we are reasonably confident that they exist. They are the laws. And these laws are, are the ones that govern this physical world in ultimate detail, in the minutest of details. The point is, and these laws are all deterministic. They determine everything. If I specify sufficiently the conditions, they tell you what will happen. They determine those things. They are causal. The point is, in such a causal world, deterministic world, is there really a room for chance? That's the point we are trying to understand. And that I have put down here, I have uh, underlined in red. It says, uh, can there really be any room for such an agency of chance or randomness, which it implies, ever so small, in a causal universe believed to be governed in detail by the deterministic laws of nature that be? That, indeed, is a question. And uh, you'll agree with me that these physical laws may not all be known to us, but unknown, they are there. We are reasonably certain of that, and nothing shall ever escape them nor amend them, and if I may, not even the great parliament <laughs> can do that. So uh, that is the assurance that we have. And the question is, if that is how we are assured of the deterministic laws, then uh, where is the room for chance? The chance there is, we are familiar with it in our everyday life. After all, we talk about various things. I mentioned some of them. The, the very common ones, the toss of a coin, the throw of a die, or also the turn of a card, the playing card that we do, in case you do that. And of course, there's always uh, the draw of the lottery. These are all games of chance, frankly so. And the question is, there is this element of chance there that makes them interesting. And at a fundamental level, you'd like to know, is this just a convenience or something, or an illusion, or something really is there, or not purely an illusion, or my eye, if you like, is there something, is there room for this chance? That's the question we're going to ask. And I think the answer will be something of the kind that I want to tell you right away, uh, and then elaborate on that. The answer will turn out to be, there are three ways, in fact, only three ways possible, as far as you know, in which chance can emerge out of these laws. And therefore, it will be there, and in many affairs of man, 
of heart or brain and uh, affairs of nations. This chance plays a notion, uh, plays a, play a role, and we shall see as we proceed how it does. As a matter of fact, I have uh, something again here because Dr. Arun Shari did mention something about lottery. That is uh, a nomination by lottery followed by, by some parties, maybe political parties. And in that context, I'd like to say this also. Surely, of course, the toss of a coin, the throw of a die, or the turn of a car, and the draw of lottery, they're all there. And these are games of chance. You can think of more. Then, of course, the, this is cricket season. I mean, in this country, is always uh, cricket season. And, uh, and even though our odds, and this is, uh, I'm saying in print, seem to be quite predictable. I mean, they're predictable to the decimal. Uh, it seems to be, but cricket remains a case in point in as much as the game invariably begins with the toss of a coin. You may ask why it is so, to decide who's going to uh, bat or, or, uh, or, or field first. And you may ask why, why this is so, why we toss a coin. This is because the toss of a coin is believed to be a random event, it's a chance event, and a chance event of a kind which is the fairest and the justest of all. As a matter of fact, you cannot think of anything which is fairer than a chance event. So much so that the great Nobel laureate uh, uh, Jorge Luis Borges of Chile, the poet thinker, uh, and this is part of his uh, Nobel lecture actually, uh, he even suggested, or people following his, his talk suggested, probably society should be run by weekly lotteries, because that will be the ultimate injustice. We may not do so because even lottery can be rigged. That's the whole problem. Uh, and that's the point he also made. But there are forms of lotteries that cannot be rigged. I will come to that a little later on. At a very fundamental level, there is a form of lottery that can't be rigged. But I don't know anyone will accept my suggestion to run a society by that method. But a thought remains so. In some sense, uh, we do it all the time. <clears throat> now, so as I was saying, uh, where is the room for chance, if any, given the fact that we are governed by laws which are deterministic? Now, again, uh, there's something in red. That's only part that you need to read. Anyway, you have copies of my talk. Uh, and that's this. As I was saying, it turns out there are three, and only three ways in which chance can emerge out of the necessity. See, when I say chance and necessity, I suppose you understand the meaning of the word because it's not a usual that necessity is uh, defined this way. Uh, chance, of course, means something which is contingent, something which is random. Uncertainty is the dominant thought there. When you say necessity, it's the compulsion of the laws. That's what necessity means. It is something compelling. I mean, there's no choice there. So the question is, uh, how can chance emerge out of uh, necessity? It turns out there are three ways it can happen, and correspondingly, there are three worldviews. There is the classical worldview, chance emerging from classical physics, as you know, and this holds in the domain of the very large. Then there is chance emerging from what we call a quantum physics and the quantum worldview. And that is what holds rigorously, I mean, always actually, in the domain of the very small. And then there is something, a view, a worldview, uh, that we call the chaotic one, the chance emerges out of chaos. And uh, that is in the domain of the complex, which is uh, the most interesting part of, uh, of the physical world today. And uh, we'll try to see how this actually, uh, actually happens. These three worldviews emerge uh, from these three descriptions, modes of description of the physical world in which uh, we live. And uh, uh, then this is a physical world that you cannot escape. That's very, very important. You cannot win it. You cannot even be even with it. You cannot escape it because there's nothing outside of that. And remaining within this question is, can you have a chance emerging out of these things? So these three I have mentioned here, and uh, the classical worldview, the domain of the large, that is sensible objects. You can touch them, sensible in that sense. Uh, or large, uh, and will show it comes out of statistical fluctuations. There is a brief description here that we should, of course, uh, take some elaborate on that.
For example, it says the classical physics. This worldview or notion of chance has emerged from classical physics, which of course determines all for all times in finance details. Fundamentally, they will say there should be no play of chance here. However, we will see that chance emerges from the tyranny of the large number of degrees of freedom. The very fact there are a large number of things to keep track of, you see, an element of chance will emerge. We shall come back to the sample again. This room, for example, containing about 10 to the 23 air molecules, if you like. How can you keep track of them? Something of that nature. Then, of course, there will be, this is for large systems, the quantum worldview. This is the domain of the small atoms, if you like. The point here is the chance, the way it appears here, is irreducible. There is no way of saying this is because of our lack of knowledge of the system or our incomplete, incompleteness of the knowledge system, as far as we know, is irreducible and inherent in the quantum nature of the world. So the important thing is the quantum, this is almost summarizing my whole talk, the quantum laws too are of course deterministic. They also determine, but what they determine are only the probabilities, the chance. A very strange situation actually. Deterministic laws, but they determine only probabilities, and that they do exactly. There is an uncertain principle. A good example is, uh, say, radioactive uranium or radium decaying, but you cannot tell when a particle will come out of it at what instant of time. Those are like random events, but that randomness is irreducible. There are many other instances also. And finally, there is the chaos worldview, which is a circleist of all because it is not something that is entirely different physics like quantum mechanics involved. It's the physics of a conventional type, but the consequences are staggering. So I will call this is much more subtle than even the quantum worldview. This holds in the domain of the complex, whole biology, whole turbulence, weather, what have you, emerging phenomena often come out of this. And here, uh, in very briefly right now, what it says is, the emergence of chance out of necessity. The laws are deterministic Newtonian, but somehow, under some conditions, the outcome, the result of the application of laws is chaotic, as far as we can tell. This is due ultimately to a very interesting concept called the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. That is, we'll elaborate on that, but please remember that this is the key phrase here sensitive dependence on certain conditions. And the creative principle here will be nonlinearity. All these terms may look slightly technical, but actually they are very straightforward. And when we talk about it, you'll see one needs to know nothing beyond uh, what we already know to understand these things in principle. And of course, uh, a phenomena like this turbulence, which is unsolved problem, the last unsolved problem of classical physics still is one believes can be understood in terms of uh, trouble, in terms of chaos. So that's the way we are going to proceed now. Uh, I'll say at the moment, uh, while there will be a discussion at the end of my talk, uh, half an hour or so, but if something quick is not clear, some uh, some uh, some word or something, please feel free to interrupt me. But otherwise, you'll be stuck with that, and you'll be concentrating on that trivial point and uh, till the very end. Um, so that shouldn't happen. So please feel free. And as a matter of fact, I would rather have this not as a colloquium, but as a conversation, if you like. But a conversation in which only I speak, <laughs> if, if you don't mind that. <clears throat> so um, next, uh, now, since we are starting, so the three worldviews, and I'm going to take them up one after the other and try to co communicate to you. The very first one, and no one can say it better than it was said by Laplace. The Laplace, the great uh, French physicist or natural philosopher, Pierre Simon de Laplace, was also called the Newton of France. Uh, uh, he was a great man. He was advisor to the royalty at the time. He advised them on how to gamble. That's the point. And the whole theory of probability of chance that we know today actually arises from his thoughts. And this is how he has put it. Uh, this is, of course, his ideas on determinism. And he said, so-called Newtonian classical physics, he said, this is really said very perceptibly. An intellect which at a given instant 
knew all the forces acting in nature and the positions of all the things of which the world consists. Supposing the said intellect were vast enough to subject these data to analysis, would embrace in the same formula the motions of the greatest bodies in the universe and those of the slightest atoms. Nothing would be uncertain for it, and the future, like the past, would be present to its life. I mean, who can say it better? That is determinism. That is the, the determinism, the solid foundation on which uh, Newtonian physics is based. Uh, until recently, no one had the slightest doubt about its validity. Given such determinism, where is the question of chance then? I mean, this says it all, and it was said by, by Laplace in the 18th century. <clears throat> now, I think it's good to remember this as we proceed. question is, in the face of this, how do we speak of chance? So let's spend a few minutes on this. How, given this, still, it is possible to speak of chance meaningfully, profitably, with some gain, actually, in the process, uh, in certain circumstances, which are quite generic. Now, um, a good example to illustrate this is gas in a box. The box being this room, for example, and the gas may be gas of air molecules. Now, just consider the magnitude of this problem. As I say here, written here, the number of air molecules in this room, if you ask for, is 1,000, roughly, of the order of 1,000 million, 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 million. That's the number that you will expect in this room. Now, this is a large number, so we call it the tyranny of large numbers, somewhere, the Avogadro number, as uh, people call it. Um, but uh, the main point here is, you will agree with me, uh, <laughs> this is too many, actually. I mean, we have difficulty keeping track of 10 particles, but we are talking about something of this order. As a matter of Tasmania, in the small place there below, the southern hemisphere below Australia, uh, there are tribes there, and they can count one, two, many, that's all. They don't even have three. So one, two, and then many. They give up at that point, many. But this is, of course, uh, something almost unimaginably large. So too many to keep track of, or to compute the motion thereof. Possible in principle, though, classically, because Laplace says, the Newton's laws, nothing can escape it. But then, since this is a practical impossibility, we settle, settle for less. We settle for a coarse grain, a kind of statistical description, which is good enough for many purposes. We often deal with averages. You know, the averages don't fluctuate too much, even though the constituents do. This is how we bring in the convenient notions of probability or, uh, well, randomness or chance, if you like, but we'll have something more to say about that. It is in this statistical sense, chance emerges out of necessity, just a tyranny of large numbers. Can't keep track of them. Little more elaborating on this particular point, though this is ultimately, uh, this room, uh, what I have shown here, I think you can see that, are this in a very simple, like stars in the sky. These are actually particles uh, in a box and moving uh, every which way. A uh, little more on this, because this point has to be understood rather carefully. So I'm repeating a bit of that and say something more. This is, there is something called the law of large numbers. Now, I'm not going to derive these laws for you. It is so obvious that uh, it's enough to state it. The law of large numbers is one of the foundations of all statistical methods. If you do any Bureau of Statistics and all, Everyone there knows everything about it, because this is the law that's the foundation of all that. So we already said there's a madding uh, crowd, not a crowd actually, crowd of molecules moving every which way, and the number I said is something like thousand, million, 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 million. And uh, these are the number of collisions they are undergoing. Imagine not only really moving, colliding, and this is the number of collisions per second, all of them to taken together. Now, this means you cannot do bookkeeping, as I tell you already. And yet, their averages, every effects, they are sensible and manageable. Because the average effect of all these billions and billions of collisions is pressure. Now, pressure is something even a child knows. If you press on he knows that. Atmospheric pressure. I mean, this is a common experience. It finally comes out of all that. But pressure is manageable. It's an average quantity. And we deal with that. This reduction from the billions of billions upon billions to just pressure is a marvel of physics, actually. It's a marvel of physics. 
the law of large numbers that reduces everything to some average quantity that we call pressure, which then we can calculate and deal with it and do many things. In some sense, the law of large number domesticates the madding crowd of random fluctuations. It domesticates that. It uh, makes them manageable. And this happens in various ways. You may wonder, I mean, I don't know if it happens to you or not, but certainly happens to me. My bank balance uh, fluctuates quite a lot. And uh, because it's small, <laughs> so it fluctuates. The stocks fluctuate, we all know, widely. But the country's GDP doesn't fluctuate that widely. It will be it will be quite an enigma if it happens. So, because that is an average over 1.1 billion people, if you like. So, that doesn't seem to fluctuate much. So, in some sense, out of the very large number, which is unmanageable, results a very manageable quality. The problem is only the numbers are small. Not too small, not one, then you can manage it. Not infinity, again you can manage it, like large number. In between, when numbers are between one and infinity, that complexity lies. Then, 100 particles are very, very hard to deal with. This number of particles, no problem. I will do the averages. One particle I can solve exactly. But 100, even the computer gives up. That's the point, see? So this is a strange thing in the reckoning of our, our universe that makes it uh, difficult. But chance gets uh, uh, domesticated by the largeness and averages take over. And everyone here, all of us, uh, live because of these averages. My blood pressure is not fluctuating uh, so many times a second. It is some average quantity, varies over uh, my age, for example, in course of years and all. This is uh, the, what makes this universe possible and, uh, and uh, we are, are, can be reckoned with. <coughs> now, so you have got some idea of how in a classical system governed by the laws, still chance emerges because too many things to keep track of and we can't keep track of them. So we say chance emerges because of incomplete knowledge, because of our ignorance. Additionally, because of our lack of interest in the details. In fact, those details have no interest. Something with the billions of billions of billions of collisions per second cannot be of an interest to you because the human brain cannot comprehend. That number roughly exceeds the number of neurons in the brain. So I mean, there's no way you can be interested in that. So lack of interest, as well as the, the fact they are just too many, to, you cannot keep track of them. But somehow, the same chance thing, which is there, of course, fluctuation, as a matter of fact, is a very useful thing. I would like to tell you not to think of chance as something, oh God, this is an element of chance, uncertainty, terrible. Not so. As a matter of fact, great things in this world have been done just making use of chance. I want to give you one or two instances of that, how chance really helps you solve problems which are otherwise virtually impossible. And, uh, and chance helps you solve it in such a way a high school boy can solve it. Hmm. So I give you some examples of that type. This is now in praise of chance, in praise of randomness, in praise of uncertainty. A good example would be uh, here, the very first one that I give you. Suppose in the odd-shaped curve, I have drawn a closed curve here, and someone says, find the area of the curve. Now, you know, even a mathematician will give up because you can't know the equation of this curve and integrate it all. Very difficult to know. But uh, children do it all immediately, actually. And uh, there's a method called the Monte Carlo method and that you must try yourself in the coffee break and you will see how, how beautiful it works. And this is purely a matter of chance and this figure shows it much better. So this is the odd figure, and you want to find the area. What you do is put it inside and close it in a larger square, say one by one, one for the area, and draw some grains of sand at random, just sprinkle on them. Say 100 grains, 100 is only too many, 10 is good enough. And uh, some will fall within the area, some will fall outside. Just count the one, the fraction of those that lie within the area, that fraction is already a good estimate of the area of this odd-shaped curve as a fraction of the total area of the square. Well, if you throw, repeat the experiment, that fraction may vary. Repeat it 10 times, and you will get the area to almost eighth decimal place, accuracy. Now, this is accuracy a computer will also have to think a couple of times before getting that accuracy. If you put 100 particles 
It's as accurate as you can ever get it. This is purely because the grains of sand will fall at random. It will be chance event, totally unbiased. In which case, the fraction falling within must be in the same proportion as the area of that thing. This is a standard method, and the best of physicists today who do complicated problems use this method, called the method of Monte Carlo. Obviously, Monte Carlo, because that's where you gamble. Monte Carlo is, as you know, the name of the place where gambling, actually known for gambling, but that method, the name has been carried over, because this is the kind of gambling. You can just try with, the, with 10 particles, 10 grains of sand, and just convince yourself with that already you get enough area. Area correct to maybe second decimal place. Uh, drop it 10 times, take the average. Well, this is, uh, for all practical purposes, the exact area. Well, not just this. This is, uh, of course, one application. People are used the element of chance to do something miraculous. You know, there, is a, there are these magical numbers called pi, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter. We all know that without pi, what is life of without pi? As a matter of fact, for mathematicians, they always say pi is in the sky. It's the, it's the abstract quantity. You can't get at it. It's just there. You have to assume like elementary particles and all. But people who believe in chance, they use these random methods and all, they can evaluate it just like that. Otherwise, irrational number, transcendental, you can't evaluate it. How do you do it? Now, this is the experiment, again, that I think you should perform. If you have some toothpicks, you can uh, do it, uh, do it very easily. And I'll, I'll show you how. And uh, this is, again, uh, in praise of chance and how chance works for you. Well, you want to find the value of pi, all you have to do is draw some lines, parallel lines here, with the distance between them, which is d, and take some toothpicks whose length is less than d. Take 10 of them and drop them over these lines. You'll find some will lie like that, they touch none of the lines, some like that, they touch one line. They can't touch two lines because the length is less than the separation of lines. Just count the fraction that cross some line. If, if you have 10 things, just count up to 10, which we all, we all do. And lo and behold, you can show that fraction is 2 by pi. <laughs> and therefore, you can find pi. This way, pi has been found to this accuracy. You see a number of decimal points here? That's the power of it. And for this, you have to drop just about 50 toothpicks. And you can do that. Again, the idea is, of course, if you knew exactly how the thing falls and all, you can calculate. But the idea is that involves too many things. So you assume it to be random, assume it to chance event, and that chance leads you to a definite result, namely the value of pi. The Archimedes, if he knew this method, oh, he would have been the happiest man, because he spent a good part of his life trying to find the value of pi. Finally, it was left to a person by the name don't think buffoon, it's a buffoon uh, who actually evaluated pi this way and surprised everyone <laughs> who was trying to do all kinds of complicated things. Well, there are many instances I don't want to take. I think the idea is clear. I don't want to belabor this point. Uh, just to indicate that pi can do wonders. Well, there is something else, uh, but I'll just give this one example. Uh, just tickle your, uh, your, your mind a little bit. Just the last one. This is the last one. This is something, a common experience, again, a fantastic application of the idea of pure chance. And that says, you may have noticed this, if you go to a bus stop at random and you're waiting for your bus to come, and suppose that bus comes on the average every one hour, no bus comes exactly on time, but average interval, one hour, you will expect on the average that you have to wait for half an hour. Your bus may have just left or you have just come in, things like that. But you can show, if you go really at random, you'll always wait more than what you should. You'll always wait more than half an hour. People, when the result was proven, people didn't believe it. And only with the coming of computers, people actually performed this thought experiment on the computer, and you find it is always so. We call it Murphy's Law. You must have heard that. Things are always worse, and they can go bad. They will go bad. This, in some sense, is also called the inspection paradox. But again, I just want to tell you, remember that if at random you go to a bus stop waiting for your bus, you always wait longer than 
what you think you should, not the mean, even longer than that. And the reason is, you're going to a bus stop is a chance event. And it's a chance that makes it this way. See, there are systematics coming out of chance. That is what is philosophically interesting. On one hand, I'm saying chance event. But I'm making a prediction which is exact and rigorous that you wait longer. Very strange. So uh, we have to remember that chance has its own certainty about it, certainty of certain kind that can be made use of. As a matter of fact, this point about chance was taken so seriously by Simon de la Plath, the great uh, natural scientist I mentioned to you, that he made a statement, everything in the world is a chance phenomenon. Now, that was uh, not easy to do. To, what about the sunrise? He said, yes, sunrise is a chance event. He said, but he rises uh, every day. If you tell someone it's sunrise tomorrow, is no news. No paper will print it. I mean, it's, it's there. But actually, it's a chance event. And he said, the reason why you don't see it is because of the simple proof. No, I don't want you to know the proof of that. Just the result of this. The sun also rises, he said. And rises with the probability P. And the P is the number of days it has been rising before you look at it, plus one, and divide the number of days it has been rising before you did, plus two. Since we know for the last at least 4,000 years the sun has been rising, the probability of rising tomorrow is this plus one, but this plus two is 0.9999994592. It is very close to one. Therefore, you find it rising all the time. There is no way of refuting this argument. Though, of course, we believe in Newton's laws, the gravitation, we can say, oh, no. But this argument, the proof of that is so rigorous. Unfortunately, the proof is very long, but the answer is very short. It's just n plus 1 by n plus 2, with m a number of days for which the sun has been known to be rising. I think that number is very large. For millions of years, they have rising, I suppose. So it's very close to 1. So you see, uh, uh, there are strange things about chance. And uh, this is just to illustrate the extreme case of that, the sun also rises. And rises by chance. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> so we remember that. Now, so much for chance coming out of, in spite of determinism in this. But there is something else where chance is irreducible and intrinsic, and not because of lack of information. No matter how much information are given, that chance won't go away. That is what happens in the quantum worldview in quantum physics. Now, this is, cannot be a talk on quantum mechanics. We don't need to know everything about it. But one simple uh, child's play kind of experiment will drive home the point. And you will have never any doubt about it, that what quantum mechanics is telling you. That simple experiment is all I want to show you, because anything else, uh, it will require then a uh, whole lot of lectures and all, which is uh, not relevant. Even then, I may not be able to communicate to you. But this one thing, there is nothing beyond this in quantum mechanics, even though it is one of the deepest mysteries of nature. So let me tell you, it's called the experiment with quantum darts. Chance is the ultimate game, um, uh, quantum is the ultimate game of chance. In the sense, even if I knew exactly how the game was contrived, whatever you do, the chance won't go away. It is fundamentally is irreducible. So I say, Quantum physics is strictly deterministic, just like quantum Newtonian. But what it determines exactly are probabilities of occurrence. It cannot determine anything else. It will only tell you and calculate exactly to any accuracy you want, but that will be the probability. That is, it calculates chance exactly. Now, this is rather a strange kind of thing, but that's how it is. Probabilities of what? Probabilities of occurrences when observed or measured. That probability or uncertainty enters intrinsically and irreducibly. You cannot uh, reduce anything else now. You have to just accept it. No amount of knowledge will help you decide or achieve higher accuracy, if you like. And as I said, therefore, not because of our ignorance or incomplete knowledge of conditions as in Newtonian classical physics. All that you can possibly know, if you know that, even then you cannot kill this chance. It will be there. The experiment is very straightforward. We all know electrons, there are elementary particles. Our TV set, all the beams of electrons hit the screen and you see light and all. Uh, transistors, all electrons inside there. 
And all I have done is I have a treat electron like a dart, and there is a gun, electron gun, which emits electrons. The idea of gun is all electrons are being emitted exactly in the same initial state. That can be ascertained. So they all come one after the other in the same in the same state. And there is a uh, something with an aperture here, a mask maybe, with a slit or aperture. Just one aperture will do for our purpose. And it goes through and hits the photographic plate here, and you locate where it is hitting it. The first electron comes and hits there. Note it down. Second electron, starting the same way, same as the condition, will come and hit where is the second here? Here. It hits there. The third one comes, it hits uh, here. The fourth one comes and it hits here. The fifth one comes and probably hits somewhere here. And like that, for no rhyme or reason, they are starting with the same initial state but hitting the screen at different points. These points are as random as can be. Now, that's very strange. It's not because of my ignorance of how this initial condition turns out all same, but they will hit at different points. This is the irreducible uncertainty of quantum mechanics. That will not go away, no matter how precisely you prepare this electron. I mean, that is all relevant. It will just do that. And this positions where they hit, one, two, three, four, will be as random as can be. And that is really uh, what I have said here. They hit the screen at random position despite identically prepared incidents. The quantum chance, pure and irreducible. You can't reduce it. Well, that is very nice. You say that's strange, but uh, very interesting. How come then we do anything at all? If that's the kind of randomness, what it tells, telling you is, if you open a door and I go out, I may go this way, I may go that way, I may go anyway, every which way. But I know very well I go where I want to. I mean, it doesn't happen that way. In fact, little more, but I don't want to go into that. If you open two doors, it tells you you may not be able to go out at all. <laughs> One door you may, you might. Two you may not. Now, these are very counterintuitive things and all. We call it double slit experiment. But this is a single slit. You will go through it. But, however, out of this randomness, which is intrinsic, irreducible, a strange order develops. If you have lots of electrons, one after another, billions of them hitting, eventually this particular screen will be filled with spots, almost a continuum. And that continuum, I want you to see, that continuum is like this. It becomes a pattern, a pattern of this kind. This height shows you the density of electrons, how many have hit at that point. So you get a pattern which looks rather sensible. No randomness about it. It will be just this pattern now. So out of random events, when many of them superpose, you are able to get a pattern. That is what you record very often, experimentally. So what is it that one is saying? And the pattern here is as if you have waves on a pond, and the waves interfere to give you troughs and crests. So there is a crest, and there is a trough, and kind of standing waves. This is, of course, a kind of duality we talk about in quantum mechanics, particle duality, but that is the important point here. The point here is, out of the random, pointillistic individual painting emerges a painting of this kind, which is perfectly ordered and interesting. So, uh, that is the ultimate in chance. You cannot beat it, you cannot escape it, it's there, but on sensible scales, when you have many such events taking place, it reduces to what you will normally call sensible. So it's very nice. Thank you. We should be grateful to nature and quantum mechanics. Otherwise, it will happen the way I said. Two doors open and you can't get out. <laughs> Things like that will happen. But we know that doesn't happen because we are macroscopic objects. We are made of many, many atoms. But if I was just a small little atom, I would have a tough time getting out of this room. Yeah, that's the point. So, um, so we have talked about two things. First, Newtonian classical physics, where chance comes out only because of our laziness, lack of interest, or too much to keep track of our ignorance. We can handle it. So many times. Then the quantum, the remains small, where chance is irreducible, intrinsic. 
But there is something much more subtle. And that subtlety was captured by the great, one of the greatest minds of the last century, Henry Poincaré. And he suspected, he was also suspected of Maxwell also, but anyway, this is the point he made. He said, okay, I, I agree with Newton's laws, classical physics, exactness, and all fine. However, what about this possibility? And the possibility was, but it may happen that small differences in the initial conditions produce very great ones in the final phenomena. A small error in the former will produce an enormous error in the latter. Prediction then becomes impossible. And we have the fortuitous phenomenon that we would call chance. What he's trying to say is that when we say something predictable, calculable, what exactly do we mean? Try to sharpen this uh, meaning in real terms. What we mean is, if you make a small error in the beginning, the final error will be of the same order. That's the meaning of that. If you make a small error, but the final error is exponentially larger than that, then that is no calculation. Because no amount of accuracy can be 100%. You will make those small errors. Hope is the final results will also be in small error. Turns out that is not necessarily true. The same laws which govern the universe deterministically, they have a provision in them. The arbitrarily small error, even infinitesimal, will produce large effects. In fact, infinite effects in a short span of time. This uh, outer proportional effects is what is unmanageable then. And that is how chance emerges actually in practice. This is what we call the chaos, and sometimes called the butterfly effect. And this effect is a nice name, if you know what it means. What it means is one flap of a bird, seagull, somewhere, with sorry, wings, could change the course of weather forever, can create a tornado in Texas. That was the original phrase, actually. And uh, uh, these are, of course, uh, exaggerated statements to prove the point. But we all know the weather is really unpredictable. Beyond 10 days, you cannot predict weather. That's the upper limit, actually. Uh, uh, one can almost say that. And that accuracy uh, is unbeatable. You cannot uh, say, have more spaceships and all, have more weather things. It will improve slightly, but not much, really. So uh, there is this butterfly effect, and we call it a serious matter. But I spelled serious correctly, S-I-R-I-U-S. Because what was shown was that if you take a table, a billiard table, and have a ball there, you know, you hit it with the cue, it hits various sides and moves, which is very precisely calculable because the classical mechanics says ball is tangible. But it was true by Michael Berry that if you have one atom on a distant star in the southern sky called Sirius, if you move that by one centimeter, its effect on this ball will be such that at about 10th collision, you cannot predict its path. It will change. Now, this proof is so rigorous that, of course, one cannot fault it. The fact you don't quite see it because long before that, many other things are happening here. You know, the edges are not sharp or things like that. But that's why it's called a serious matter. It's an uncertainty of that order we are talking about. It's not a small error, small error here. Arbitrary small error somewhere producing a finite error in the final outcome. So that is the, the statement uh, one is talking about, whereby deterministic laws can give rise to an uncertainty of that order. Now, now this is something understandable, and a small example is right here. A small example. Uh, I have a, have a pin standing on its point. Now, of course, if you put it exactly vertically, it will stay there forever. But we know it is an unstable thing. If you slightly, ever so slightly move this way, even think at it, it will go this way. Slightly this way, it will go all the way this way. So you see, the final result this way or that way, it depends on the slightest movement this way or that way. That's what the Greeks called Klanemann effects. As a matter of fact, it's amazing. The people even at that time thought of such possibilities that there is a strangeness in this universe, that effects of this kind can happen, but now we have for theories for those things. And this is a spin standing on its point, and slightest movement this way or that way will take it all the way here or there. 
Same thing if you want a convex surface, put a ball, a slide on the top, it will stay, it is there, but slightest movement this way, this, it will go all the way. We call it is unstable kind of situation. The irregularity, unpredictability, chance arising out of instability of this kind. Small errors initially causing very large effects. And uh, uh, that indeed is an idea which is easily understandable and uh, we accept that. Now some of these things are put uh, graphically. Uh, for instance, uh, this is just to show you what I mean by that. I have just plotted what we call kind of a, a graphical picture of uh, two points indicating the motion of an object, whatever it means, and a neighboring point, very small distance, also propagates like that, stays close by, but very soon one goes this way, other goes this way. These are the things that we call indicate sensitivity to initial conditions. Slight initial differences here, and eventually you end up in different parts of the world altogether. Well, these are the uh, things we call it deterministic chaos. It follows the equations as a deterministic Newtonian physics, but uh, it has randomness in it in the sense that we normally understand. Now, there are uh, people who make the living out of study of this. It is one of the most hotly pursued subjects over the last 15 or 20 years, actually. And I give you one small example of this classical determinism. Uh, people, uh, I know there are the motion of planet galaxies, all appear so accurate. Eclipses can be predicted with seconds accuracy, thousands of years in advance. All this looks very nice. But a simpler system will be just a billiard, as I mentioned to you, of this shape. It's called a stadium billiard. And a particle moving, getting reflected at the, at the boundaries. And you may wonder, how does it move? Or something here, excluded middle. And the particles, of course, move like that. In both cases, after the fourth or fifth collision, you cannot predict the motion. Because that will require accuracy of an order that humanly is not possible. So these are called various kinds of uh, billiards. And I mentioned a serious matter, it's contained here, that uh, one actor moving on Sirius by one centimeter will make this motion already unpredictable. So, uh, so this uh, is, uh, I think I have uh, uh, indicated the point. Uh, the last few minutes I want to, uh, uh, I'm a slightly exceed one hour, but, but we have half an hour discussion, so we can slightly compress it. Um, uh, just to tell you a tell little bit a uh, way of thinking about these things in case you are interested. And it is, you can visualize the geometry of chance, the geometry of randomness. How? Uh, you can uh, visualize the motion of a particle or any object for the matter. So we all know, it has a position, we all know. An object has a position. That means uh, uh, left, right, fore, aft, up, down, or sometimes longitude, latitude, altitude, or the coordinates x, y, z, x, y, z. You locate a point. But then it also has corresponding velocities. We call them u, v, w, for instance. Now, if you specify x, y, z, and u, v, w, you have specified everything. Then the laws of physics will take over, and Newton will tell you where it will go. And that's uh, the motion. Now, uh, the fact of the matter is, since the laws of physics are unique, in the sense they give you a unique motion, that means in such a picture, a, a phase space, six dimensional, three velocities, three position, a point there is a complete specification of state of motion. From that point, only one trajectory can move. Because if there are two, that means laws are not deterministic. But we know the laws are deterministic. Given initial condition, only one possibility exists. So it will go like that. It can never intersect itself. Because we intersect, then the point of intersection, two trajectories seem to be going, not allowed. So you can never intersect yourself. And of course, you want the motion to remain finite bounded. You don't want to go up to infinity. You see, these two conditions are in conflict. Because if I'm told like a prisoner, stay in this room, bound it, sure, move any way you want, but you should not visit the same place twice, because that will violate the uniqueness of laws. So I keep moving, I go there, I come back, but I can't go there because I have been there. So the more you move, the less space is left for you to move. And you have to keep moving. Now, this is a strange condition. No prisoner, no matter how astute he may be, what experience he may have, he won't be able to do it. But very soon he'll find, oh, he has covered every point, and then he can't move at all. 
even though he's made of an atom, he'll feel that way. Then what will happen? There are three and only three possibilities. You don't have to be mathematician to say that. One, you keep moving and finally you can't move. You just stay there. We call that a fixed point. That's all there is to it. No further motion because you wanted those things. Other is, ah, you say, ah, I can do something better. What? I will move on the same thing periodically. So I keep going like a planet. Or oh, that I can do because I don't intersect anything. I just join in and it's called a limit cycle. You are just periodic. Both are simple motion. One is don't move at all, stay put. Other is just go periodically. This is normally that we think of deterministic universe. But there is a third possibility. And that is what the chaos is all about. A third possibility is you keep moving but go nowhere. What it means is you have to make your motion so fine in some sense so that you, you keep moving, you never go where you have been, and you, and you still move. That means your motion will become finely textured. It will be a very fine-grained motion now ever avoiding. So we call it eternally self-avoiding, eternally non-returning motion. That motion will be very, very complex. It will be intricate motion, whereby you avoid yourself all the time, you remain bounded, but keep moving. I give you the picture of that motion. <coughs> to the extent it's possible, well, first two are very clear. I moved till I went to a point, no matter where I started from, and stay put there. Like a bowl, you put a Marble, it does this and finally comes to the bottom. No matter where you throw it, it'll do that. Other is, you do cyclic thing. Got it. When it goes from here to here, here to here, you cannot predict. If you toss a coin, call this heads, call it tails, and start tossing a coin, the tossing coin, heads and tails, will be exactly of the same kind as doing this here or doing that here. It will be as random as that. You can only list it. You cannot predict it. That's the meaning of chaos. But something else, these lines that I have drawn here, they look rather nice. But actually, if you magnify it under the glass, you will see a strange thing there. And that strange thing is just this. You take this small portion of that, suppose I have some part of the motion, you say here, Take a small portion and magnify it. Within that, there is this now. Three-lane highway, if you like. Take a small portion of that, magnify it, you will see again a three-way highway. It is intricate system, so-called self-similar. It is an inward-bound, implicate universe, technically called it. That is, within every small bit of that, the whole thing is implied again. A self-similar fashion. That is how reality escapes you sometimes. Because you take any fine view, within that, the whole thing is again implicated. That's what we call Yathar Pindyat Rabhaman. You know, things of that kind is happening. It is this uh, self-similarity of motion uh, which uh, is there in the motion of a chaotic object. And a good example that you can do if you're shaving in the morning is look at the razor's blade. A razor blade. It actually, if you're under a microscope or like a glass, you'll find uh, it will have serrations. It is not that smooth as it looks. Even the advertise is so smooth, actually, under the thing. You'll find something here. But take a small portion of that, magnify, within that, you will again see serrations. Take a small portion of that, put a microscope, you'll again see serrations. It is like walking on razor's edge. A chaotic system walks on razor's edge. Because Whatever motion it has, within the motion, the entire motion is implicated in the small, in a smaller version. You see, that's why we call it intricate, chaotic, something unpredictable, and this can give rise to a physical motion of this kind. This is actually the motion of Earth, Moon, and the Sun. Compute it, and uh, you can see the Earth, Sun, and all. Eventually, it will get ejected. It's a chaotic system, actually, not, uh, not to be worried about too much because it'll take a long time. But actually, Earth, Moon, and Sun is a chaotic system. Eventually, one of the bodies, the lighter one in the Earth, will get actually ejected. And there's a time period involved, but uh, we call it, therefore, three is a divorce. Three bodies 
in universe are outer and stable. There is no way in which they can stabilize. One will get ejected always. There are, these are all signs of chaos which are built into. Now, I don't want to go uh, too much here. I just give you a last example because you can play with it and, uh, and, uh, and you will like it. And this is uh, how you can generate randomness or chaos of yourself by a rule which you frame yourself, which is deterministic, but the result will be chaotic. And uh, this is the game that nature has played with, the, with, the, with our life. That is ATGC. I mean, you know, you may not know ABC of it, but you should know ATGC, the three uh, amino acids out of which, of course, you make uh, the building blocks of uh, DNA. So uh, I give you a rule. Start with A. Where we write A, make it AT. Write A, it goes to AT. Where we have T, make it AC. Deterministic. Where we have C, make it GT. Where we have G, make it BC. So start with A, A becomes AT. Then this A becomes AT and T becomes AC. And keep doing it. You will get a sequence. Lo and behold, this is a typical sequence in a DNA. Now this was a big surprise that if you take a random sequence of DNA, that's that kind of sequence you get. It's as random as can be. There's merit in coding information in random systems. That's the maximal coding that you can do. Anyway, the point is, this is a random sequence, and, uh, and uh, it's strange because the law rules are deterministic. Then in what sense is it random? It's not fluctuating in time or something. It's random because given starting A, if I ask you, tell me, what will be the tenth member here? You have to iterate the whole thing. You cannot shortcut it. You cannot write a formula. It will give you what will the entry at the tenth place. Now oh, that you can't. That is the sense we talk about uh, algorithmic randomness. A randomness which really matters in all computations at all. Can you have a shortcut? No. You have missed the whole thing. This is the point. So I think if you have got this point, then you have got what random is all about. Uh, last uh, view graph is, uh, there are so many other things, but there's no time for that. And this, I think you will like it, because uh, it tells you that people have thought very deeply about this problem. And they have come to a situation uh, where uh, they are asking, what about things like free will and all? Is there something to do with free will? So free will also seems like as if it's not governed by Newton's laws of motion. Oh, that will be deterministic then. Free will is free. Is therefore freedom something to do with chance? That question comes to the mind. And, uh, and one of the greatest uh, physicists of our times, uh, Maxwell, uh, made this statement. <clears throat> I'll tell you which one, the very first one here. What he said, of course, he was the first person who talked about chaos. Uh, ninth century, he said, possible clue to our free will may be implicit in this idea of chaos. So what he said was, as we said, undetectably small causes, we already talked about it, and manifestly large effects follow from sensory dependence on its conditions. We have talked about our chaotic system, our complex neuronal brain, for example. Hence, our unpredictability, we obey the letter of the law but not the spirit of it. That's the whole point. Law we can't escape. You have to obey it as law. But the spirit of it, namely deterministic, or that we don't obey because uh, it is so complex that we cannot uh, reckon it. It is in this and in this sense only that we may have the free will. But its range must and need only be infinitesimal because no leopard can change his spots. No matter how much free will he has, he can go this way and that way, but the spots he cannot change. They will be there according to the laws of physics and chemistry. So there is a limited part of here. But there is another thought which I think we should keep in mind, particularly because Dr. Aaron Shari talked about lotteries. So I want to say something about it in that context. Um, which I already mentioned to you, a game of chance, a lottery perhaps, is the wisest and the justest and the fairest way of deciding among the equally valid alternatives based on, this is what's called the Babylonian lottery. Jorge Luis Borges, uh, they argued that society may well be run just be through weekly lotteries. You can think about it 
it might yeah. But the last one is something that may interest you, with which I will close, and uh, it is just this. It is a subtle is the Lord. In what sense? Stand in front of you in Virat Roop, say, here I am. That will be too simple. God is not going to do that. He will manifest himself in such a way that you are always left in doubt. Only if you have real belief, you will believe in him. Otherwise, there will be ample doubt, and therefore it works. He will manifest his presence subtly and leave you, the unbeliever, eternally in doubt. Chance provides him this subtle concealment, the perfect and the ultimate alibi. You will never be able to trace back to him. His thoughts are expressed only through uncertainties, statistically, cannot be traced back to him through reason alone. So reason, by definition, is the Newtonian in some sense. So what I have told you, finally, in the course of the lectures, there are a lot of other materials, because these, these subjects have been investigated so much, that chance can come out of deterministic laws. Classically, because of our ignorance, there are too many things to keep track of, so we go by statistical arguments. In quantum mechanics, where, of course, chance is intrinsic, deterministic, but determines only probabilities, irreducible. And third is, within classical mechanics, obey the letter of the law, but not the spirit of it, in the sense, there is a sense of dependence on initial conditions. Approximate causes give you terribly approximate results. And therefore, it is difficult to keep track of that. That's why the weather uncertainty of that, and it may well be that somewhere along the line the Almighty is expressing his will through this chance. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Kumar, for that very fascinating lecture. Now, I just want to make one comment that um, Professor Kumar told you that the chance of the sun rising tomorrow is 0.999 something and not one. And that's, I think, uh, the most interesting aspect of this whole uh, lecture, that uh, what we call certainty is there, but uh, in a very wheeled way, kind of. Uh, uh, the talk is open for discussion. You keep your... Uh, this thing vertical, all those in this words. abstract you provided in the first page, you use the word adjective casual for universe. Can you explain? Causal, 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 causal. Okay. Sir, do you think uh, fate and the chance, come here, the fate and the chance are the synonyms, while the fate can be predicted by astrology, can the chance be? Yeah, see, uh, first, uh, I, I, I knew that this question will come, somehow, fate in some sense, uh, chance. See, it's, uh, it's not bad. So chance, the way I have spoken about, is a, is a very well-defined concept, I mean, uh, it's, it's a scientific concept, in the sense that there's a way of going about it, the way of understanding it. Uh, when you talk about things like uh, astrology, now, of course, right now I must say that I do not know enough about astrology. That's one thing. Even though my brother, brother himself was an astro uh, astro astrologer, but uh, he, could, he could never convince me. Uh, my belief is that uh, uh, one can study anything, of course. Regularities of various kinds can be studied, uh, probably. But uh, astrology doesn't seem to be science in the sense that it's chemistry, mathematics. So by fate, if you mean the prediction of astrologer, I have nothing to say. To me, it's irrelevant. It's, a, it's not a well-defined concept. If you draw some figures, you can make the prediction, but it has nothing to do with reality. So what I'm saying is the chance when I talk about, even though it has superficial kind of looking like connection, it is not in the sense of fate and all. Hmm. It's not in the sense of fate. In fact, fatality will be more like Newtonian physics. That everything is fixed. You can't do anything. And, and you cannot move. Even a leaf can't flutter. That will be the uh, fatalistic view. Uh, but we know that's, uh, uh, that's a classical physics uh, view and all. But astrology is something else altogether. People who work on that uh, based on casting horoscope. My feeling is uh, it seems interesting to me. 
but I am reasonably convinced it is utter nonsense. Hmm? It is utter nonsense, not just nonsense, it is utter nonsense. That's my personal view. I have said as much in academia magazine too. Yeah, one question here. So Einstein uh, said, you know, God does not play with dice. You know, what was the thinking around that time? Because, you know, he himself yeah, was a proponent sure. of... Uh, so I think that's what uh, the question is. Einstein had one said, Her Gott, wilful nest, which means God doesn't play dice. <laughs> that is, God is not playing with chance and gambling and all, all these gamblers, uh, Laplace and all. Uh, uh, God uh, is definite, he says this or that. So, so quantum mechanics, because it talks about uh, probabilities or chance as an irreducible part of it. That even in principle we cannot be certain, Einstein would have nothing of that. He didn't believe in that thing. However, uh, with the passage of time, we now know that though Einstein himself contributed so much to quantum mechanics, a major contribution, but he himself was not quite convinced of that. He thought there are hidden variables somehow or something else. Ultimate theory is there. Quantum mechanics is incomplete. Someday we'll find out the real reason. But this hasn't happened. And so far, there is nothing that we observe which tells there is any truth in what Anderson said. On that count, he seems to be on a very weak wicket. I mean, that is certainly not, not true. But today we are, I mean, again moving back to finding a single theory and all that. Uh, and yeah, but that is but ongoing research goes on. It is not saying that uh, there is an ultimate uh, determinism of the kind that classical mechanics say. It doesn't say that. We do not know the ultimate theory. See, there is like this. You can always take a refuge. I don't know the final truth. So why not believe in astrology? I mean, that's also a viewpoint of I it. Mean. But see, we should not take refuge in this kind of my feeling in this argument of this kind. Because we will never be sure that we know everything. But we go by what we know. And science is very seamless. You know, we cannot take out one brick here and leave the rest there. The whole thing will fall. We have no evidence of that. So it seems quite reasonable to go along with the, the, what uh, physics says, for example. Science, I mean, I mean, science in general, physics because that's somewhat fundamental in some sense, says, uh, I think we'll go along with that. If time comes when you, you find something has gone wrong, observationally is falsified, then we'll think. You know, no theory can be verified, can only be falsified. No? That's the whole point. Uh, sir, uh, as a physicist uh, and a philosopher, what is your comfort level uh, with the idea of human cloning, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't think this is going to proceed along the deterministic line. But be it in the quantum framework or the chaotic framework, or I don't know whether uh, some other framework. Well, uh, as for me, frankly, uh, this is a thought I don't want to think about because I can't sleep. And I think what uh, uh, Pocker has said in your presentation here, a small error in the former mm -hmm. will produce an enormous error in the latter. Now, my feeling is that uh, uh, in this realm, uh, well, I don't know whether God plays the dice or not, but man is trying to play the dice. Mm -hmm. So I wanted your thoughts yeah. on this. I can say something. Uh, I'm not a biologist, but uh, probably I can say something here. The point is the following. What you are saying is element of chance say in, the, in, in biological systems like cloning or genetic aspects and all. We know there are mutations. Mutations take place. They are in some sense errors. And that is what is normally called chance. And necessity is the actual uh, uh, the evolutionary principle. Now, mutations, of course, happen. I mean, for example, a cosmic ray particle can hit you and uh, cause a mutation. Those are fairly random events and all. But, uh, and the fact remains, a small mutation can have large consequences. I mean, that no one doubts, of course. That's true. But the fact of the matter is, a complex system has a stability of its own. You see, today I eat uh, rice, tomorrow I eat wheat. I don't become a different person suddenly. Uh, one wonders why. Wheat is so different from rice. Idli is so different from uh, what I eat in the Punjab. But I still remain the same no? at a very macro level I'm talking about. The point is, complex systems have an inherent stability of a kind that is very hard to imagine. Is complexity, because we are evolved creatures and all, complex creatures, because we are stable, that's why we are what we are. So even though uh, I understand errors can happen in, in uh, cloning and all, and it can sometimes lead to people believe, a monster or something, of course, he won't survive. Chances, see, all errors are fatal in, uh, in biology. You can take it there. I mean, there is hardly any exception to this. Errors are all fatal. Reason being, we have evolved over 3.5 billion years, 3.5 out of the 4.7 billion years of the age of the Earth, 3.5 billion years living things have evolved. This evolution has well honed, you know, it has tried to do many things. And it is reasonable to believe and experiments show 
that uh, mutations are always dangerous. They, they, they kill you. Therefore, chances are our stability actually implied by and guaranteed by this fact that we don't survive them. So we don't produce, reproduce, and therefore it doesn't propagate. So in some sense, there is stability to it. However, surely uh, mutation uh, can lead to a, a control condition. You can create a, uh, a being, uh, a chimera or a monster. I mean, it can happen. There is a Brave New World story people have talked about. But uh, in practice, whenever they try to mutate them, it doesn't survive. Very few mutations survive. I mean, which last, which they live, they are very few. There is a phenomenon uh, called, which is a rather technical, but I will mention to you. You see, we have shades, like the color. We have shades, no? a dark, a gray, and all. It is very strange. How can there be continuous variation of shades when we have, uh, can uh, have mutations and all? It turns out there is a, something more subtle going on there. There are slight variations also, which are almost continuum, which is uh, only now known that this is the way it happens. So a mutation is not so drastic. It will just change one extra spot on the, on the leopard it will give you. That kind of mutations are harmless, but they are happening all the time. And, uh, and they are tolerated. But radical mutations are almost invariably uh, fatal and lethal. Uh, my apologies. Well, I just wanted to ask the professor, would you like to take a position on uh, human cloning? Like you have in taken a position in, on astrology, you debunked it. In, 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 in sense of what? Is it possible or not? No. Uh, Do you support it? it? Are you against it? <laughs> that, that is a question of uh, value system. No? What we, my feeling is, no matter what position you take, it will be done. See, science can be stopped by someone's uh, liking or disliking and all. This has never happened. You may delay it. A government's delay. A government will fall. And this idea, science doesn't, is not easy to domesticate that way. Because a researcher's mind is there, no? He is thinking all the time. He will find ways around. So, first of all, whether you like it or not, mutation will happen. The whole might of the mightiest government will be against it, but it won't last. That's my personal feeling. Mutation will, I mean, uh, your uh, cloning will take place. And, of course, it's taking place. Maybe not on human, but at the moment uh, on other things, animals and all. But uh, eventually, <laughs> I suppose it has to be on human too. I think these are... Uh, uh, these are uh, foregone conclusions, my feeling is like that. This is what I think. I'm a personal thing whether you should do it or not. By all means, we must do it. We must do it. I, I, for fear of something happening, we should not stop science. I think that's the wrong thing to do. Because eventually it will get done and we will arrive too late, that's all. I think we should do it. Uh, people hopefully have wisdom too and they will realize that this is a... Uh, should be done something in the interest of the people. We are talking about wisdom versus uh, other aspect of curiosity. I think uh, uh, I, my feeling is in the passage of time, people will know how to handle the moral issues that, uh, that come out of this. But uh, I will be totally against, uh, I mean, if I am asked against uh, cloning, if I look forward to it, unfortunately, I, I, mean, I think I'm too old for these things. But uh, I would have loved to be around when uh, a human is cloned. In some sense, you know, it's happening. But you mean at a fundamental level, test tube, put something, starting with the elementary constituents and all. Well, even that will happen, I suppose, eventually. I'm, uh, I'm for it. A short answer is, I'm for it. No matter what consequences. Yes, sir, it is uh, said that very act of uh, observation alters the momentum of observed. Mm -hmm. So, in, in that alters, uh, situation, alters, alters the uh, momentum of observed. Object. Uh, object, yes. object under conservation. Observed, I'm saying. The object, whether it's observed. a particle, observed. sir, whether it is. Sure, object. observed. So, from there, uh, we, we could see in the many of the uh, legendary uh, physicists uh, moving from physics to religion, religion to philosophy, philosophy to spiritualism. Uh, is that process uh, random or a determinist uh, process? See, in the, in the physical sense, of course, you rightly said that this is one of the principles in quantum mechanics that uh, in one way we are saying it's the act of observation or measurement alters the state of the object that you are measuring. That's uh, one way of looking at uh, Like a Heisenberg microscope, very powerful microscope. You can look at a very small object, but for that you have to use very short wavelength 
and that short wavelength will almost kill that object actually like uh, so there are things of that kind but uh, uh, that is that stands on its own that's the actual physical principle and all uh, but your question it goes beyond that right you are asking to say sir i'd like to clarify mm -hmm. when you say the, uh, the infinity as a as a uh, conceptless uh, thing in that whatever uh, thinking whatever the uh, actions are based on a, a reference points mm -hmm. where the uh, uh, infinity cannot have a reference uh -huh. point so what you are, i think what so you are from saying from there is, you uh -huh. go to a different uh, dimension so. yeah i think you are asking for some philosophical question are the objective realities independent of our subjective uh, uh, interference and all you are things out there like pi in the sky that's the mathematicians say pi is the sky it's there that's all nothing you don't your measurement doesn't do anything to it it ignores you totally I mean, even measure or not is, is there there are concepts of this kind but surely we know the thought the, the evolving process and uh, ultimately whatever we say is our thought to be modified uh, is not the old uh, uh, view of pythagoras and the greek philosophers that these thoughts are all there uh, permanently eternally and uh, only we are discovering them it may be we generate these things in the process of uh, it's quite likely that the, in fact the whole universe probably we are creating every moment in some sense i mean one can only thing is i don't know what to do with this idea i mean it's not quite clear it only gives you a, a liber, a liberates you from orthodoxy that certainly it does that you have a point you evolve it and thing like that see henry poincare made a lot of study on some of these issues actually i refer to him because he was a very precise person for example question like morality no morality is not contained neutral laws of motion the principia doesn't say morality anything anyway and the question was can morality be also derived from the laws of physics such questions people ask and his answer always was the following you know in grammar we have things called moods moods imperative mood huh? indicative mood he said science is in the indicative mood but the mood of morality is imperative so they differ grammatically this grammatical difference makes it so difficult to uh, connect them already and uh, so i do not think at the moment that there is a way of deriving for example uh, so called moral laws which uh, which we would love to have uh, the way many philosophers have talked immanuel kant has talked about it but really we have not made any progress of that kind in fact one believes this is not so i mean the laws this kind of laws a morality principles and all value systems are not reliable uh, from uh, physical things though many sensible things can be said though like whatever is good for you should be good for everybody in some sense then that's good it should be universal one can make statement of that kind but that's not something deriving from uh, something it seems like a reasonable statement uh, but i don't think you can uh, derive uh, but universe description may be ever evolving is not something all ideas all there you just go and find them you we redefine things as you want i think that certainly is happening even universe expanding <laughs> even that can be taken for granted in some sense is open uh, sir you have very rightly said that the indicative mood and the imperative mood have got uh, Uh, mood, uh, mood. Uh, mood. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mood. The grammatical, uh, grammatical yeah. difference. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my question is slightly uh, different. Um, do you believe that the quantum physics is also uh, sort of indicative or uh, supporting this thing, uh, the old age concept of aham brahmashmi, like the universe is within me? So the same patterns are getting repeated. So uh, in some way or the other, the age old concepts that we have in our uh, mythology that is getting uh, sort of supported. Well, I'm, really, I'm really not a competent philosopher in this sense, but I can tell you the following thing. Uh, see, it's very clear. Our, our ancients have thought very deeply. They don't doubt of the fact. I mean, they had plenty of time and thought very deeply, but they have not arrived at a conclusion based on experiments. See, the the ultimate arbiter in science is the experimental thing. If it doesn't agree with that, no matter how beautiful theory will be, it has to be abandoned. However, some thoughts do resonate. For example. you know the idea of uh, nirgun brahma let's say nirgun brahma now see these are these are very powerful ideas the idea is nirgun brahma is as we do in physics today it's 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 a, it's a very well defined thought now not a arbitrary thing at all it says 
that why things have properties. Brahma is nirgun. It has no, no gunas. There are no properties. Imagine a total absence of properties, like vacuum in some sense. Then, how will it acquire properties? That is like Nirguna Brahma. The properties come because vacuum in some sense has no property, means totally symmetric. Symmetric means there is no bias of any kind. It's not this and not that. Neti, neti, neti all the time. That means it's not this and not even that. Because to be that, will be biased then. So Nirguna Brahma means no property as such. Total symmetry. Everything else comes from the breaking of the symmetry. From sphere, I have become an ellipsoid, if you like. An ellipsoid, I have become tetrad or something. The idea of Nirguna Brahma giving properties, gunas, is not very different from the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking of a symmetrical entity. And this succession of symmetry breaking spontaneously is the, is the what we see around them. The fact that there are things and there are different things, different colors, have all seemed to be descended from this spontaneous broken symmetry. And I think, uh, uh, I, I, uh, personally, I like this idea, and I like to think in terms of uh, the idea of Nirguna Brahma, where the gunas are acquired to the, uh, this process of uh, uh, broken symmetry. I mean, one can make philosophical statement. They even help you somehow, sometimes, to think along the direction. But I will, uh, but our ancients were the, themselves were the first to say, Neti Neti. And not even this. What was I said, even that may be wrong. See, one has to admire the humility of the, of the, of the ancients. I mean, uh, that's what I would say at the moment. This is uh, commonly, un, I mean, sort of known or uh, understood that uh, like our planetary system, there must be another planetary system in our universe. Like our? Our planetary system, planetary our system, system is, is, should be, I mean, more there like this, all probable chances are there. So with what, uns, I mean, certainty, this chaos theory can predict that what kind of, uh, I mean, how many or what uh, systems are there in the universe okay. of our kind? Uh, see, this question of uh, extra life or exoplanets or life elsewhere, are we alone? This yes. kind of question people have asked, huh? are we alone? <laughs> we are not. Yes. Uh, now, there is a, I just tell you, these questions people have tried to speculate upon and do quantitatively also. Yes. For example, there is something called Drake's equation, yes. which gives you the probability of finding another planet yes. of our kind with carbon-based life. The probability is one. Probability is one. one. So, it is definite. Mm -hmm. And not one, mm -hmm. according to him, as many of the same order as the number of stars. Mm -hmm. There are two, two predictions there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One is the probability of finding another one, of our carbon-based carbon life, so yes, it's yes. like us, yes. is one. Yes. Uh, that this is one of the things of Drake's equation. And the second is that as many of them as roughly the number of stars, which we know is quite mm -hmm. large. Right? So I have no doubt the conference of this kind taking place elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, personally, I have no doubt about it. Maybe they come to the same conclusion, the same question being asked. I mean, could be. I don't know. But uh, the Drake's equation was taken seriously because it is based on uh, very, very plausible and reasonable ideas about the nature of our universe, the way the universe is distribution of matter, elements, and all. Taking all that account, so it is not a uh, guesswork. It's yeah. a serious yeah. equation. People have studied the equation itself in, in many ways. So the answer is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, almost probably one, there, there will be. And, of course, uh, if you enlarge the question, say any kind of life, mm. uh, I mean, certainly, I think that we will find in our own galaxy, maybe. Mm. Not our solar system, but our own galaxy. So uh, then you say, oh, I mean intelligent life, mm. as intelligent as us. Mm. That is very improbable. Mm. They will be either much more intelligent than we are, are much less intelligent than we are. The probability of finding the same level of intelligence is almost zero. Mm -hmm. This is a, a theory, this is based on a general theory, mm -hmm. that, uh, see, the universe is very old. The, our intelligent human life, human-like people, they span only a few million years. Mm -hmm. Or this whole span is a very small window. So it is very unlikely that the similar, exactly the same kind of intelligence would have appeared. So barring that kind of quality, intelligence and all that sort of but uh, life, living systems which reproduce, multiply and all, 
some elementary education. Chances are either they are highly advanced or, or they are not at all advanced. And that's why many people said, scientists still said, don't try to explore other universes. Because if they find, chances are either they are far more intelligent, they'll make slave of us. <laughs> they'll come and colonize and make us do other things, sweep floor or things like that. They'll do that. Uh, other is, of course, they are just uh, amoeba or something. Then there's no use. So they actually warned, cautioned against exploring, uh, like project, uh, you know, that, what's it called project called SETI, SETI, SETI. Uh, um, they were against it actually. But anyway, I mean, uh, I think I have answered to yeah, some extent. Right. Thank you. Yeah. 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 After such a fantastic, wonderful lecture. This is by chance I'm finding here. Why I want to say that is, uh, I come from the same institute where uh, it was the NCOMA study. Uh, I happen to know now. And there is a chance. And I'm asked for this. Or is there a chance Kasurangan was the person chief guest when he gave me my certificate? Is there a chance? <laughs> All are here. So, with that, uh, and regarding the average, this term point, I think uh, we also know in our language uh, this uh, day of God is in average type. What he does is when average people does. And God uh, manifests in average people. And God expresses through man average people, in not high and That's about average. He also talked about it. I don't know what, I, what more I can say. Only I can say uh, we are honored for the inspiring, wonderful lecture. And uh, as a way of our attribution, let us give our way of operation, we have thanks. Thank you.